Let's take a look at the supporting cells in all of this. So the neuroglia, these are the cells that support neurons. Remember neuroglia, these are not conducting. They don't conduct electrical signals. Rather, they're more there to help maintain the environment for the neurons. Let's start with the central nervous system. So remember brain and spinal cord, that's what makes up the central nervous system. In the central nervous system, there are four main types of neuroglia. They are listed out here and they are shown over here in the schematic. So let's take a look at some of these that are very important. Oligodendrocytes, these are the types of neuroglia that provide the myelin sheaths on the axons. So if you come up to the picture up here in yellow, this is a neuron. Here is another neuron. These each have an axon, right? Here's the long axon. And notice those axons are wrapped in this pink stuff. This pink stuff is called the myelin sheath. Where is that myelin sheath coming from? If we follow it, we notice, oh, here's a cell. It's actually projecting out from this cell. This is an oligodendrocyte. So this is an example of a neuroglia or a glial cell. And they are providing that insulation for all of these axons in this vicinity. There are some other cell types in this picture. Moving over here, these spidery looking ones, these are called microglia. Microglia are interesting because they can actually move. They can migrate around through this tissue and phagocytize things. They can eat things that aren't supposed to be there. Um, so they help to clean up the environment. Astrocytes, here's an astrocyte shown in green. Astrocytes do a lot of different things. I have a slide just for astrocytes. Uh, coming up in just a minute. Astrocytes do a lot of work for maintaining things like ion balance around the neuron and providing nutrients to the neuron. Um, they have a very close association with the bloodstream. See how it's wrapped around this capillary. Um, the astrocytes are actually what provide the blood-brain barrier. You may have heard that term before. That's, that's possible because of these astrocytes. Finally in this picture we have the ependymal cells. And these are cells that produce and secrete the cerebrospinal fluid. So this is the type of fluid that exists in the spaces, the ventricles in the brain. Um, and cerebros cerebrospinal fluid, it also descends down the very center of the spinal cord. We'll be seeing a little bit more of that later on. So four different types of these supporting cells in the central nervous system. It's a little bit different in the peripheral nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, just two main types of supporting cells, neuroglia. We've got Schwann cells. In the peripheral nervous system, these are the ones that make up the myelin sheaths. Okay, so a different name, oligodendrocytes in the CNS, Schwann cells in the PNS. And then also in the peripheral nervous system, we have satellite cells, and these are other supporting cells that we're not going to be going into a whole lot of detail on, but um, good to know that, that they exist. Let's focus in on these Schwann cells for just a minute. So in the peripheral nervous system, we have these Schwann cells, and what the Schwann cells do is provide the insulation for the axons. These cells are kind of interesting. If we were to look at one Schwann cell, and lay it out flat. It's actually a really flat big cell like a pancake and then what happens is it wraps around the axon multiple times so it ends up being like a cylinder around the axon. The cell itself is what makes up the myelin sheath that's shown kind of in pink in this picture. There are gaps between adjacent Schwann cells so right here would be a gap, um, here would be another gap and then there would perhaps be another neighbor Schwann cell over here. Um, those gaps are really important. They allow impulses to be conducted. We're gonna see how that's possible in a little bit later on here. Uh, but this wrapping, the fact that the Schwann cell does wrap a significant portion of the axon, this actually allows the signal to be sent more quickly than it could otherwise. Coming back over into the central nervous system. So in the central nervous system, that myelin sheath is provided by this cell type, the oligodendrocytes. And the fact that these oligodendrocytes provide a myelin sheath, this actually explains why, uh, you may have heard of this phrase before, we refer, to, we refer to different regions in the brain as being white matter versus gray matter. Well, the reason that we talk about white matter is because this myelin sheath it looks white, literally. If you if you were to cut a cross section um, and look at it, the myelin sheath would look 
kind of white and that makes sense if you think about what it's made of so essentially this is um, in large part this is going to be plasma membrane it's a lot of lipid sort of material and so it's going to look like white fat essentially that's wrapped around here if we move over and look at the cell bodies and the dendrites um, so places where there is no myelin sheath then instead of looking white it looks gray so in cross sections of spinal cord or brain tissue um, there's a distinct difference between these two regions and it it comes back to where is the myelin at the myelin is where the white material is at we mentioned that neurons are not generally able uh, capable of dividing pretty much once they are formed that's it they uh, do not undergo cell division. However, they are capable of being repaired. If they experience damage, it's possible for them to, to undergo, to some extent, regeneration. This is particularly true in the peripheral nervous system, not so much in the central nervous system. So let's look at the peripheral nervous system here for just a minute. And we're gonna focus in on this neuron. So it's wrapped with Schwann cells. Those are providing the myelin sheath. And let's just suppose that there's some sort of an injury that happens. This neuron gets damaged right here. So first thing that will happen is this at the site of this damage um, and the rest of the axon coming over here to the right, that's all going to degenerate and get cleaned up. The immune system would come along and clean, clean up these little fragments. Um, however, the Schwann cells do something really neat. The Schwann cells actually stick around and they provide an environment that facilitates regrowth of that axon. So we would say that these Schwann cells provide what's called a regeneration tube and they secrete growth factors. So this axon will tend to regrow. It, it takes time. Remember, transport has to happen down this axon in order to get raw materials down here. Um, but over time, this axon will grow back. It'll grow through that tube of Schwann cells and the Schwann cells essentially guide it in the right direction. So eventually that axon can remake a connection with a muscle or whatever it is that was over here. So regeneration is possible in the peripheral nervous system. And that's because of the Schwann cells. This is not really possible so much in the central nervous system. And that's because remember in the central nervous system, we don't have Schwann cells. We have other types of cells, oligodendrocytes, and they do not, uh, they do not react in the same way. If there's damage in the central nervous system, cell death of the oligodendrocytes is what tends to happen. So there's nothing to facilitate regrowth of the axons. So this is why things like spinal cord injuries are so serious and, and potentially permanent, whereas damage in other parts of the body, right? If you, if you have a cut on your arm or something, um, eventually it heals and you, you don't have necessarily nerve damage that's permanent at that location. That's part of the peripheral nervous system, not the central nervous system. Whether we're talking about the peripheral, peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system, either way, these cells that provide the myelin sheath, these are so critical to allowing the nervous system to do its job. And it turns out there are actually some diseases that um, are caused by problems with, with the myelin sheath or with the cells that are supposed to provide the myelin sheath. So let's look at a couple of examples of, of these diseases. These are called demyelinating diseases because that's exactly what they do. Some examples of demyelinating diseases, multiple sclerosis, this is probably one that you have heard of more so than um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, but both of these involve degeneration of the cells that provide the myelin sheath. In the case of Guillain-Barre syndrome, the immune system, which we'll be learning about later on in this class, the immune system itself actually targets the myelin sheaths and attacks them. So that's very serious. That's a, a real serious problem. This is happening in the peripheral nervous system. And the end result of this is that the person would experience muscle weakness um, because the signals are not able to transmit over to the muscles correctly. So there's not as much activation of skeletal muscles. So muscle weakness is the result. In the case of multiple sclerosis, this also involves the immune system. Uh, some of the cells of the immune system would actually target 
the myelin sheaths in the central nervous system, specifically in the brain, and that also is going to end up in demyelinating these neurons, and then those neurons will not be able to signal as effectively. So those can be really serious diseases, um, and they all revolve around these either Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes. Let's come back to the astrocytes for just a minute. So the astrocytes, these are one of the types of glial cells in the central nervous system. And I mentioned before that these do a lot of different things. These are the types of cells that have a close association with both um, the capillaries in the brain and also the neurons. And some of the things that they do, um, just the fact that they project out into, into the space around the neurons, this means that they're really well positioned in order to maintain the environment, the ionic environment around a neuron. So for example, one of the things that they do is they'll take up potassium ions from the extracellular environment in order to just maintain the proper ion balance for this neuron. Another thing that they will do is take up extra neurotransmitters. We'll be talking about neurotransmitters later on in this module. Um, neurotransmitters are the chemical messengers that get sent between adjacent neurons. So those can be taken up by the astrocyte and recycled. These projections over to the blood capillaries allow the astrocyte to take up glucose from the blood and then ultimately the astrocyte can hand that off to the neuron. So essentially the astrocytes can provide energy molecules for the neuron to be able to make use of. They can also store excess energy and sort of keep it on hand as a reserve for, for the neurons to use later. Astrocytes also help to facilitate formation of connections between different neurons, so uh, synapses, the formation of synapses, astrocytes can play a role in that process happening. They can also help to facilitate uh, what's called neurogenesis. There are certain regions in the adult brain where new neurons can be formed and the astrocytes help to govern that process. Uh, another big thing that they do is they provide the blood-brain barrier. So the fact that the brain is so protected from um, potential toxins that might be in the blood, um, the, the role of the astrocytes in part is to keep the, keep the connections between these capillary cells really tight so that things cannot leave the bloodstream and make their way over to the neurons. So astrocytes help to maintain the blood-brain barrier. So those are some of the things that astrocytes do. I have a lot of these listed out on the next slide. Here they are. Um, but it's just nice to, to kind of look at the picture while we think about all of these different things. Finally, this is a table that, um, I'm not necessarily gonna read through it with you right here, but this is a useful table to refer to in case you forget what some of these different terms are that we've been using. Um, useful place just to come back and, re and recheck what was a motor neuron again, or, or what was the peripheral nervous system. So table 7.1, this does a nice job of capturing a lot of these different definitions.